I know. <laughs> it's always something. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just wanted to take a moment just of silence. Uh, you know, I, I don't, obviously I recognize we got a lot going on in the world right now and I don't want to uh, act like we're not aware of the pain that has been brought to all of us through uh, the coronavirus as well as now what's happening in the U.S. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment for everyone to just pause and just kind of reflect for a moment. If you are a prayerful type, then uh, say a prayer if you'd like. If you just want to send good energy to whomever uh, that might be impacted, um, please do. So we'll just take a moment of silence beginning now. Thank you very much. Um, and we'll get started with our agenda. I see someone else is just joining us, so uh, we'll, we'll catch that, up with them. I think that's Jenny. Jenny, are you there? Uh, hi. 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 <laughs> Do you have video or are you just doing um, audio? Uh, I'm laying in my bed right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I'm glad you're here to listen <laughs> and see. That's great. <laughs> Welcome. Oh, thank you, lady. Where are you calling in from? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Just for housekeeping purposes, I'm going to have everyone put themselves on mute so we don't have background noise. And then if you want to ask someone a question or whatever, all you have to do is hit the space bar and that will unmute you. And you can speak, and then when you let go of the space bar, then you'll be back uh, able to speak. So today's agenda includes a presentation by Simon, who is going to share a little more in detail about his Camino experience. And hopefully Annie will still be able to join us. And I'm going to check my messages here in a moment to make sure I'm not missing something with her. Maybe there's been a mix up in times, but uh, if Annie is able to jump on, she will talk about Phil's Camino and also uh, walking to... You see, I can never do it, walking the Camino. And then also we might do a little show and tell at the end if you have something that you wanna talk about that you might have purchased or any kind of memento, anything special from your Camino. And as always, we'll have free time to talk a little bit as well. So today we posted our first Camino Cafe chat interview. Corey and I did that earlier today with uh, Tim Modine. So please watch the video today and give us a little feedback on what you think of our interview. It is going to be something we're going to start doing with hopefully all of our community members. I have a real passion for bringing Camino experiences to life and I feel that Facebook does a decent job, but I feel like just looking at people's pictures and scrolling through is not enough. I don't I feel like being able to verbalize and really talk about our experiences is really powerful. So that's why we're doing the interviews. So those of you that I know well, Cynthia and Beth, by the way, um, I will be asking to interview you. So I hope you'll let me. Uh, so anyway, watch the video after the call if you get a chance. I am not a good editor yet. So I completely messed up the very beginning. So it'll just jump right into the interview. So anyway, I'm learning. And uh, Corey and I are learning how to interview people at the same time. So that's going to be an art, I'm sure. But anyway, I don't want to steal any more of Simon's time. So we'll let Simon take the floor and talk about his experience. And when he's done, he's been gracious enough to agree to do some questions and answers. And um, we'll go from there if you're ready, Simon. No worries. All right, let me try and share screen. So if everyone else can mute, please. Okay, it says host disabled participant share screening. So I think you have to give me access. I have to give you access. How do I do that? <laughs> Ooh, I'm not a Zoom expert. I normally use WebEx. Uh, let's take a look. I'm going to make you a host and that will probably allow yeah, you. Yeah, that might. Okay, let's just see if that works. Okay, I just made you the host. Let's see what happens. Okay, good. I can now. Okay. Uh, can oh, what's happening there? Can you see my screen or not? Yes. Uh, we can you see, see like your whole screen, not just the slide. Okay, there. Can you see that? Is that better? Um, it's blank. Okay. All right, this is it. There we go. 
yeah thank you i'm going on you all right. So look, first of all, this is a, a bit of an old school. It's a presentation I did about five years ago for a uh, for my walk, which I did in 2013. So apologies for all the zooming in and out. It's 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 a little bit old school, um, but I I just thought look I'd I'd reuse it and just use it as the basis for for a bit of a chat. I, I did the, the Camino in the September of uh, 2013. Um, so it was in, I guess it's towards the end of summer, going into, into autumn. I started, um, I, st I didn't start at uh, saint Jean. I, I landed up starting in uh, Pamplona. And for the simple reason that um, I, I was a little concerned, you know, I'd read that there was a, a number of people did injuries in those first few days going over the Pyrenees. And I just thought, look, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to get back again or how long, you know, because it was hard to get five weeks off work. Uh, I had to book my, my leave, you know, two years in advance to take that amount of time off work. So I thought, look, I'll, I'll, I'll hedge my bets and I'll start from Pamplona. So I did a slightly shorter one. I missed those first three days. Um, but from there, it was actually, it, 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 it actually wasn't uh, an issue at all. So this is a little bit about me. Um, I'm based in Melbourne. I'm 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 a techno sort of geeky sort of guy. I uh, I do a lot of work in my my background is uh, uh, I went to uni. I've, I did a degree in maths and computer science. I've worked in marketing and sales. I work for a big American company that does electronic test equipment. Um, so I'm I'm very much a sort of a, 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 a sort of your your typical geek, uh, you know. Um, uh, but I do actually have a very broad interest in, in, in culture and history. Uh, I am quite an outdoor guy. I, I do a lot of walking. I do a lot of hiking. Um, I'm quite a sociable person as well. If you want to work in sales and marketing, you have to be sociable. Um, so there were a, a lot of things that attracted me to the Camino and, and to the, the cultural side of it. Uh, and, you, you know, it was interesting when I got there. I you know, I had my, my reasons. I'm, I'm not a particularly religious person, but, you know, I've found people from so many different walks of life all walking for slightly different reasons. And I think that's what I actually loved is that you could pick all these different reasons. You could pick aspects of these which to enrich your journey. I mean, while I'm not an overly religious person myself, I really learned to appreciate the, 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 the uh, Spanish uh, culture and the religion, the, the, you know, the, uh, the beauty and the strength of the Catholic Church in those regions that we were walking through, and also the, the, uh, the remnants and the remains of the Moorish uh, um, uh, culture and religion from the times of, of, of Andalusia, and that there's a lot of those still there, and they, they're beautifully preserved, and you can really learn a lot from that. Um, and, and being, you know, a social person, I found that while I went by myself, I didn't stay alone very, for very long. Uh, very quickly, you know, we could find people of like mind and similar interests from all parts of the world. And so you start to develop this group of, of people, um, sort of Camino family, um, some of whom I'm still very close with. Uh, you know, and uh, it, it, those that, that, that was what I sort of slowly grew along the uh, walk, um, and, and so with this mix of reasons, you know, many of which I I found personally reflected my interests and other interests. You know, it, it, I found it, that that's what helped in, in enrich the whole experience. Now, for me, you know, I thought, okay, look, I better be organised. You know, I, I have a sort of engineering background. Okay, let's let's get really organized on this whole thing. So I put together all the things that I need to do, you know, and being a, a typical nerd, I had all the northern maps of northern Spain, all in PDF format, they're all on my phone, all carefully there, I had an Excel list of all the albergues. I even went as far as buying a camera with a Wi-Fi, so I download the photos from my camera onto my phone, onto my blog spot, get good quality photos. As I didn't speak any Spanish, I thought, okay, look, let's let's get an online dictionary. And I set up my blog spot for the trip. I got a local phone number so that I was in the EU. I'm naturally pretty fit. I do quite a bit of hiking. Uh, I, I, I've done inline skating. I do that twice a week usually. And I've done that for about 15 years. So I am physically quite fit. Um, and so I sort of got all those things right. Then 
there was a couple of things I just kind of didn't get around to doing. Well, one was actually a community preparation course, which came to bite me afterwards because um, I thought, no, no, look, I'm sure I can wing it. And, uh, um, maybe some basic Spanish would have helped because I kind of got to Spain and discovered that, that outside of hola, I didn't know any other Spanish words, which would be quite a drawback in a country where large parts of the Camino route, folks don't speak anything other than Spanish. So the, I really discovered I should have put a bit more effort into that. Um, I kind of never really got around to looking at the waterproofing side. I thought, oh, Spain's always hot. Won't be a problem. Oh, well, guess what? It's not always hot. And this came to bite me in a big way, um, as I then discovered that uh, we had unprecedented rains, as you'll see, and not having good waterproof clothing was a, was a serious problem, and I had to sort that out along the way. Um, the one thing as a traveler from outside, you know, I've traveled a lot for work, and I've you know, traveled around the world just on personal holidays, and but really, when you start getting into northern Spain, into rural Spain, it really is quite different. It's very, very different. And everything from the language, and look, I mean, I've used a, an example of Australian English, you know, feeling schmick in your budget smugglers, having a shardy in your arvo with your mate. So basically, feeling good in your, um, in your bathers, having uh, some chardonnay in the afternoon with your friends. You know, um, Australian English, it's like American English, we use a lot of slang, a lot of um, <clears throat> colloquialisms. Well, it, it didn't matter what English you spoke in some of these smaller towns, you weren't going to be understood. You had to adapt and you had to learn quickly how to understand basic Spanish. And that was my sort of one downfall. But I, I learned quickly. I made an effort. I try and sort of learn a few word, new words every day, get some basic grammar, um, try and start asking you know, questions uh, of my Spanish pilgrims with me, trying to... Uh, get enough that I could basically look after myself. I should go into a shop, I could order things, I could buy things, I could uh, you know, book a room at night and things like that. Um, and it, it's, it's, I think uh, that's part of what enriches the trip is actually learning some of that, that language, learning the, uh, 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 the Spanish language. Um, I found the, the landscape's quite diverse. You know, you, you, you have certain images of Spain is either all coastal or it's dry interior, but it's, this is what I found on the walk was it's really diverse from the mountainous areas to the Mazetta with the dry, to the Bierzo with that whole microclimate, to Galicia, which is incredibly sort of a verdant, green, and, and it, it's, it, it was actually quite stunning. You know, I'd sit there walking along some of the days on, in some of the regions, and you just stop and you just look around you, and it's, it's, it takes your breath away, um, just how beautiful that part of Spain is. Um, it, as a walker, it's amazing seeing folks uh, just grabbing fruit from the sides of the road. I must say, I wasn't quite too sure whether to, to eat them or not, but then I saw the uh, locals also just grabbing fruits, just, you know, hanging on trees, you know, figs and grapes and berries. And farmers would sometimes just, you know, we were quite open and said, yeah, just, just grab some grapes as you go through. Some of the farmers were really, <clears throat> very generous with their, with their fruit. Um, and, and just the level of activity. And I mean, the, the bottom photo on the bottom right, you know, this is, uh, I went through a small village where the farmer had taken in a whole load of, of those grapes and they're all in buckets. And inside, unfortunately, I didn't get a very good photo, but inside that room behind, he and his, his wife were still stamping the grapes. Just, they were using gum boots and uh, they were just stamping the boots and crushing them down into w w wine and they were making their own wine. Um, so that rural way of life, is still very strong in, 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 in parts of Spain. And, you know, when you come from <clears throat> Australia, uh, where you have a highly mechanized farming life, and my mom's side in, uh, back in uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa and Zimbabwe are also, well, they, they were farmers, also highly mechanized. So going through and seeing these, these farmers and these farms, which are still quite traditional with cattle herders and uh, a lot of that, it was, was, was Quite a reveal for me. I'd not seen that before, and I didn't expect it either. Um, if you're going to do the Camino, there's a couple of things you really you need to be uh, 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 prepared for, and one of them is you, you do need to love thy neighbour. 
in, in an almost uh, literal sense, because you're going to be sleeping next to somebody in a bunk, which is sometimes, you know, only a foot apart. Um, and uh, so you need to have that, that sort of uh, ability to adapt and uh, unisex toilets. The Europeans do things quite differently. Uh, uh, so when you go into the, the unisex toilets, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of an eye opener. Uh, don't forget to close the shower curtain. Um, it's, it's, it can be a bit embarrassing if you don't. Um, you know, it, it's uh, quite regimented, uh, the lights out at 10, which is actually both good and bad, because to be honest, most of us were pretty tired by 10. Um, and it did ensure that you got a, a good night's sleep if you could avoid the snoring. Now, having said that, I am actually a snorer. So um, I, I suspect I was probably... Uh, guilty of disrupting a few people's night's sleep um but uh, it, it's 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 if you're staying in the alb alb albergas it's it's actually quite a i found for me quite a refreshing experience you really have to learn how to to work as a community you have to sacrifice some of your individual liberties for the communal good and the result of that was the communal meals you know, in the evenings, we'd sort of have a couple of drinks together, we would chat, that sort of sense of community uh, was the trade-off for some of the inconveniences of the sleeping arrangements, the living arrangements. And that was such a strong feeling, um, being able to, to listen and to share experiences, insights, understandings with people from all around the world. And that's why I actually quite liked staying in the albergues. I did treat myself every now and again. Uh, the one was, I did have one ref a night in, well, I had a couple of nights in refugios. Uh, the one that really counted was after about three weeks of walking, I had my first bath. It was so good, I took a photo of the bathtub. I never thought I'd love a bathtub as much. It was just wonderful. But, um, you know, it, the, the good thing is there's a balance. You know, if, if you find the albergas a bit too hard going, you can opt for refugios, you know, there's, you, you can mix it up. And sometimes mixing it up is actually adds a little bit of spice to the whole thing. Um, now that sense of community I mentioned earlier, you know, these are strangers that, that you meet. Uh, unless you're going with somebody, and when, and when my case I didn't, I went by myself. Uh, and I actually preferred it that way. I, I prefer walking by myself. Um, these strangers that you meet become friends and they become very close friends. And uh, it was funny, I, I met a, a, a guy there. He, he was actually a, a quite a senior guy, I gather, from the US State Department uh, in the uh, George Bush era um, and sort of knew George Bush and all, the, all these sort of guys. He was quite a senior guy. Um, <clears throat> and he, there he was with a backpack, struggling along like the rest of us. Um, you know, he never complained. He was very, very determined. And you know, he, his observation was that it's the only place in the world that he's ever been that he, you can meet somebody and you chat and within 10 minutes, they're your new best friend. It's, it's such an open and trusting environment. And I'm guessing environment he came from probably the exact opposite. Um, he found it unbelievably refreshing that people were tended to be so honest, so open, so trusting, so embracing, um, and it, 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 that sort of statement embodied it in so many ways that, you know, it, people who, who are attracted to doing that sort of walk tend to have a lot more in common than, than, than they have different. Uh, they have that determination. They have that cultural openness and awareness. They have an inquiring mind. They have a, 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 an ability to listen. And I found that generally most of the people that, that I met had those common and similar traits. And I think that's what I found so attractive is that we were all able to actually get on with each other. And you do develop such a strong bond, you know, and, and you all stumble through. In, in English, English is largely the sort of lingua franca. Most people speak some English in some form. And, um, <clears throat> you know, the, 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 you, you, just, you, you just learn from each other. Um, the other thing was, you know, after a good walk or a stop, invariably the get togethers tend to be very impromptu. You know, you all just sort of pack up your bags, you, you wash up, and then you all just get together and you either go for a walk together, you go grab a drink together, you grab some tapas, uh, you um, take silly photos, um, you talk about, you know, 
what, what happened during your day and things like that. I actually even made it into the local newspaper. I don't speak any Spanish, so I don't actually know what the newspaper is writing about me. Hopefully it wasn't something terrible like, you know, uh, Pilgrim wanted uh, for some nefarious activity. I don't think it was. Um, but uh, yeah, some, uh, I was just busy looking on the map going into Estea and uh, I happened to turn around and some guy was taking a photo of me. So I gave him a smile uh, and then discovered myself in the paper the next day. Um, so I just took that, that along as a little keepsake. Um, yeah, so uh, it, it, it was a, a, an interesting experience all around. Um, this is one of the photos I actually love. It was actually three of us uh, in the, um, I forget the, the, the name of the town. It's, it's the one where you have the rooster in the church. Uh, I've just forgotten the name now. Um, and it, it just kind of showed, you know, in those shadows, you can't tell anything about those people. And there were three very different people. I was the one in the middle and there's two, two other uh, ladies that, that I met along the way. You know, our shadows were all the same. Yet our lives and our backgrounds were so totally, totally different. We all spoke different languages, lived in different countries, had different jobs, different cultures, different to everything else. But, but on this Camino, when you, when you looked at our profile and our shadows, we were just the same. You know, we were all walking, we were all looking for something, we were all experiencing something and sharing something and enjoying something. And it just goes to show how, how skin deep our, 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 our uh, the uh, differences are they, they really are uh, what we have in common is just so much stronger than what than, than what sets us apart but the best bit look I, i'm a bit of a foodie not a big foodie but i do like my food you know um i must admit after a week of the pilgrim's menu i get a little tired of it <laughs> um, and started looking for some other food this for the food in spain is, is fantastic absolutely fantastic it's hard not to love the food um, I, I, you know, and I, I loved exploring Spanish cuisine, trying all the uh, different things. Um, you know, for refreshments, as I say, you know, there's the, the choice is always wine, wine, or wine, you know, and you can't go wrong because the wines were absolutely delicious. Um, the only thing I did run into a problem was, was I'm, I'm a, a traditionally, I'm a tea drinker, not a coffee drinker. Now, trying to drink tea in Spain is a challenge it's 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 not a cultural norm and um i i really struggled getting a good cup of black tea with milk you know sometimes i'd get green tea with milk um but it was uh, it, that was about the only thing i did struggle other than that it was i found the diversity the variety the the, the wholesomeness of their food you know the, the one observation i made I compared here to Australia, and I suspect it's the same. The number of fast food restaurants, there seem to be very, very few fast food restaurants in that part of Spain. If these were largely family owned restaurants, family run restaurants using local products and local ingredients, which I think I here in Australia, I think we have moved away from too much. You know, and we, we, we miss some of that. You know, we can go to farmer's markets and get these things. Well, my experience in walking through the Camino was that pretty much most of my meals from the, from these small restaurants were the equivalent of farmers markets. They were all local ingredients, local products, cooked locally uh, and developed locally. So, and that was so refreshing to be able to do that. And the food was delicious. Now, what's, what can you expect? Uh, well, we, we can expect some pain and dis discomfort. It doesn't matter how fit you are. It's, it's, it's not an easy going to walk 25 to 30 kilometers per day, which is what, 16 to 25 miles or 16 to 20 miles. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it is grueling. It, it, it does push your body to its limits and, and you need to expect that, you know. Do your, your, your walks, you, you do need to be up early. Uh, you know, it's, it's not recommended to lie in bed till midday and then settle because you're probably gonna to struggle to find somewhere else to sleep or to get there uh, during, during daylight hours. Uh, blisters. We all had blisters, you know, and, and there's ways you can prevent it and ways of treating it. Um, the mud and the rain I didn't expect. So what happened to us was uh, we just sort of we were part way into the Mazetta near Honatus or Honatadas, uh, um, and then the, the heavens opened and it rained, and I, it really, really rained. And you can see from that middle photo, 
it was getting so bad. We were struggling to walk on the roads. In the end, some of us started walking in the fields, like on the right hand side, because the roads just got so muddy. We found the fields were actually a little bit better. They just cut the crops, cut the cut the grain, and the ground was a little bit firmer than 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 the roads. It was just terribly hard walking, um, and it was it was uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable. And but you know what? You kind of just push through it. You just adapt. You just learn. You just take it on board, and you just push through it. And one of the guys was asking the alberga, the guy who ran the alberga, the hostelero, you know, what's tomorrow, tomorrow's weather going to be like? And the hostelero said, well, it's, it's walking weather. Because it doesn't matter what the weather is, you'll still be walking. You'll still be pushing on. So you sort of become a little bit immune to it in the end. You just push through and you just adapt to it. Um, now, for me, look, I, I, I do love architecture. I mean, this is something I've always had a a bit of an interest in a yen for, and boy, that part of Spain just fulfills every need from, from Roman you know, floors with the little individual tesserae uh, to Gaudi buildings to you know, a, a medieval uh, um, dwellings. Um, it, it, was just, it was just stunning. It was absolutely stunning, you know, to those traditional sort of Galician sort of, I don't recall the exact name, sort of around houses. It was just phenomenal just seeing that level. Now, Australia is a very new country. You know, uh, European settlement in Australia was seven, from 1788. Our buildings are not old. We have, you know, we're a very new architecture. So going back and seeing this beautiful old architecture was just a feast was for, uh, for me. Uh, to, to take this in and enjoy this and the beauty of it. Um, arrow fever. Now, anybody who's walked knows what arrow fever is. You spend half your life going, where's the arrow? I've got the arrow. I've lost my yellow arrow. And, uh, and um, everywhere you go, you just see these, these, these arrows uh, or, or, or the shell as well. And, and, and it's just, it, it becomes a natural thing. You know, you're sort of walking along and you don't even know, realize that you're doing it. It's, it's subconscious. You, you, you look for the arrow, you look for the shell, you know, just to say, am I still on, on the right path? Am I on the right way? And occasionally we'd get lost and locals would be very kind and point us back in the right direction and off we'd go and we would start walking in back in the right direction. Um, but it's, 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 uh, it, it, you don't ever imagine in life having that sort of uh, um, level of interest in a little yellow arrow. Uh, so for me, what did I get out of the Camilla, well, you, you certainly toughen up. You, you really do toughen up. There's no doubting it. You, 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 if, if you're going in and you're expecting a cruise ship experience, you've booked the wrong holiday. You do have to get tougher in so many ways, not just physically, it's also a mental toughness and emotional toughness. Um, you, you have to toughen up your social skills. Uh, you, you have to toughen up a lot of your preconceptions in life as well, because you it does, it forces you to reevaluate some of the ideas and values that you held before you go into this. You have to go, wow, okay, maybe, maybe I've been a bit too narrow. Well, I haven't seen a bigger picture here. You know, you really do have to toughen yourself a, a little bit. You definitely learn some Spanish, because uh, you know, if you didn't have any Spanish like I did when you started, you certainly have some Spanish at the end. Uh, and, 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 and that's a good thing. You know? uh, planning and preparation, you, you know, it's, this is a two-edged sword. On one hand, it's good to get your preparation right. On the other hand, I learned very quickly, don't plan too much. Once you're there, once you've got everything, don't plan too much. To some extent, just let it unfold. Walk, decide in the morning, okay, I might walk to here. If you're gonna to walk to that town or village, walk there, look for somewhere to stay at the time. Don't plan too far in advance. Let some of this unfold naturally, let some of this uh, uh, be a bit more org organic. And so this is where I found was a nice balance, you know, uh, just being able to sometimes just find something that you like and uh, just, uh, 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 just decide on spare of the moment, be a bit more spontaneous. You know? And I've definitely got a much better awareness and collection of jocks and socks. And I'm not sure if jocks translates into the uh, US term, but underwear basically, because if you're walking 700 to 800 kilometers, you need good underwear and good socks. So um, I've now got probably a good collection of good socks and jocks. <laughs> you know. My advice to others, you know, it, it really doesn't matter why you're walking. You, you, you find your own reasons, find your own way. 
it, it, as long as you, you're up to it, do it. And for me, actually, in some ways, getting into Santiago was a bit anticlimax. It was a bit disappointing, actually, in some ways, uh, because I'd enjoyed that journey so much. I kind of didn't really want it to actually finish just yet. I was happy to put in another week of walking, actually. I was really enjoying it. So it really, it truly is a case of the journey, the people you meet, the friendships you make, the places you see. It's very much that. Don't just sit there and count down, oh, no, how many days took this to Santiago? How long should I get there? It doesn't actually matter. It really doesn't matter. You know? And I think there's some life lessons from this as well. You know, when you, you meet interesting people along the way, don't be too influenced by others. You know, don't be too, you know, listen to others, take on their opinions and insights, but ultimately just be true to yourself. You know, this is an opportunity for you to do what, what you want to do. In my case, you know, I still had younger children. My youngest has just turned 20, turned 20 yesterday. Uh, but you know, I did this seven years ago. Um, so I still had kids at home, busy life, home life and things like that. This was a, a, an opportunity to put all of that aside and to really just do what you want to do. To be actually quite selfish in the sense you walk with whom you want to walk, you walk to where you want to walk, you stay when you, where you want to stay. Um, and, you, and you can actually really explore your, your own interests and values quite a bit. You know? and, and, and open that up to other people. You know? Understand their cultures, understand their insights and their ideas and, you know, and things. So there we go. That is my story. Oh, Simon, that was brilliant. Just brilliant. I, I love hearing more about your experience. Um, love the uh, walking weather and the arrow fever. <laughs> Great quotes. Um, what prompted you to go in the first place? Uh, uh... A couple of people I knew had done it a few years before, and uh, they'd spoken highly of both the good and the bad. And um, the more I read about it, and, and at that stage, I must go back. So I did this in 2013, and I was sort of planning it the two years before. There was almost nothing on YouTube about it. I really find, struggled to find content at that point. It's changed a lot in the last seven years. At that point, there was not a lot of content. So... I, I could find the odd blog post and the odd article and things like that. But, um, but the more I read about it, the more I, I became interested in it. And I think I just needed a break from life. I needed a break from my routines. And so it was just, it kind of aligned. Uh, does anyone, everyone can unmute if you have a question for Simon or a comment about his experience. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for the time that you took to explain everything that you did. I think it was beautiful. And my, for, my every, pleasure. Yeah, for everyone that loves the Camino, just to see the story of somebody else is just like to add. In my case, I have never been there, but I feel like I am because I have read so much. And, and I, I went there, not in, in a Camino way, but I went with my family because I was living in Madrid with my husband and my kids. So I really appreciate everything that you explain and the pictures are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. My pleasure, my absolute pleasure. I, and I had a quick question for you. Sure, a lot of people say that they come to like a breaking point, either mentally, physically. Did you get to that point? And if you did, you know, where did you go to tap in to whatever it is to continue? And what did that look like for you? Yeah. Look, absolutely. I, I, I certainly had probably a couple of days where I was just like, oh my God, this is just too much. This is just too much. And, and you know what? Um, I probably had one session where I, I, I just sat down, I was by myself, and you, you just have a good cry, you let, you let it all out, and then you just have, you know, you just get, and often it's a buildup of emotions on a number of things, not just a community, because you're by yourself, you're thinking about things, and you just let it all out, and I found for me that was very cathartic, and then I was back up, um, you know, and sometimes you can, you know, there's some of the people we were close enough we could chat to, um, but I think... Yeah, it, it, it was one of the things you, you learn to solve these things yourself. Uh, and certainly in my case, when, when I had those really tough days, you know, just something spending some time by myself, um, 
reflecting on things, putting things in perspective. I kind of got through it. The physical one's a bit harder. The physical one, you do have to listen to your body. And that's a bit of an, if people have a physical sort of breakdown, um, there you need to be very cautious about listening to your body. If you're pushing too hard and you're starting to get injuries, you do sometimes need to find rest days. And, and I didn't have to do that, but I did see others I was walking with who did have to do that. And encouragement was, guys, if you're really starting to have physical issues, stop, just stop, <clears throat> take a rest day, go and see maybe a doctor or something like that and, and, and take a break. Don't push too hard. Thank you so much. All right. Simon, I'm just curious. Yes. Yes, I just sorry. I just saw a question there on on blisters. So look, blisters were a shocker. Um, what I did in the end for me was I took surgical tape with me, and I'd read this somewhere. And I, each day I'd put uh, some new surgical tape on the on the base of, of, of my feet, which I which I for my walk. Um, where I did struggle though was blisters between my toes. That's where I had the worst problems was was blisters between the toes. Uh, in hindsight, um, I've seen you can now get these socks, these like walking socks, uh, toe shoes and toe socks. I think next time I do it, I'm definitely going to experiment with those um, because you, you can't cover your entire foot in surgical tape. I did try, but um, it wasn't, it, I had some success. In the end, I started putting surgical tape between the toes and it did help. It wasn't very comfortable though. Um, so blisters is something you really do need to work on before you get there. And I didn't do enough on that. I think getting better footwear, uh, better foot care, um, preparation before you start your walk is actually really vital. I can't hear. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, Simon, um, what three things would you definitely recommend to have in your backpack? Ah, that's an interesting one. Um, look, a small torch, because there's nothing worse than if the if, if room's dark and people are going to sleep or you've got up early and things like that. It's nothing worse than people trying to switch on the light to find out what's in their backpack. Mm -hmm. So it's just a small torch where you can just discreetly open up and look for something in your backpack, grab whether it's your you know, toothpaste or something like that. Um, that was one thing I found absolutely vital. Um, what else did I have? A manicure set. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Must have a manicure set. You know, don't underestimate the value of having a good little set of scissors, a nail file and some nail clippers and stuff like that, because you're going to need it along the way. You know, you're there for five or six weeks. Um, so a good quality manicure set was, was another one. Um, what else? Well, for me, a chocolate bar, because <laughs> I do enjoy my snacks along the way. So I'd always have a pouch with snacks. Whether it's a chocolate so bar, some man. nuts. <laughs> so <Absolutely. snack. laughs> I see there's a question there about walking shoes or hiking shoes. What would you recommend? Look, I, I went to walking shoes um, for the simple reason I, and I started my training with walking boots. Uh, uh, and, I, and in the end, I went down to, uh, uh, to, to shoes. Um, I found hiking shoes for me work better because I liked the having the, the harder heel, the, 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 the less flexible heel. Um, especially on some of the areas, uh, you, some of the sections are quite rocky. Um, and if the, I found the walking shoes when I was in training, that can sometimes bend too much and you can't get quite as no, enough grip. So I went for hiking shoes, not hiking boots. Uh, also, a, a half a size up from your normal foot size, because when you're walking, you know, for half a day, your, your feet really do expand and swell quite a bit. So make certain that your shoes are just slightly bigger than your normal uh, shoe size or, or your normal foot size. May I ask on that, Simon, because I've heard a couple of people say that about the shoe size. Did you train in the bigger shoe size before you went? Yes, I did. Yeah. Okay. And then did you wear your backpack with weights or what did you do to simulate? No, actually I didn't, that was, I didn't do that. I didn't simulate the backpack at all. Okay. I started wearing the backpack when I got there, <laughs> <laughs> which I shouldn't have done. I should have actually done a bit more training with the backpack beforehand. But things, because I'm naturally quite a fit person and I, I, I've, I've done, uh, I do inline speed skating and I've done that for about 15 years now. Um, so I, I do about five hours of skate. Normally I do about five hours of skating a, a week. 
So I found that my, uh, my, my, my legs and my core were, were actually very strong. And so I didn't have, have an issue with it. The problem I had with the backpack, which I should have trained more with, was getting the straps right. That I really messed up to start with. In the first few days, was, I had really uncomfortable because you really should fit your backpack to your body. Um, and that goes from the way your hip belt is, is set up and tightened to the distance between the backpack and your back. So getting these, the straps which come down the side here, um, I didn't do any of that and I regretted that. And it took me a few days to get all of that sorted and then work out what was working, what was not working. So that's probably the more important reason for getting your backpack is to make certain it fits your body correctly. Good tip. I think there was another question in the chat. Um, what did you bring that you thought you should have, but you could have let go of? Oh, so, okay. I, I bought, I don't know why I was thinking about this. Okay. So I'm flying from Australia. I'll take a nice set of clothes, jeans, nice shirt and stuff like that. Uh, I had to carry these damn things. <laughs> so I was like, no, nah, you know what? I really don't need a, a, good, a good couple of pairs of clothes or sort of dress clothes. You know, I, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, so I did regret that, uh, taking, taking those clothes. Uh, um, and I think I ditched some of them <laughs> along the way. So uh, how, many yeah, pounds, so, how many pounds was your backpack? So in kilos, I had about uh, nine or 10 kilos. That's about 22 pounds, 20, 22 pounds. That's a lot. It's, it was on the heavy side, okay. yes. Hey. It was. Yeah, that's a lot. So yeah, I, look, in hindsight, I should have been a bit more cautious in what I packed and how I packed, and I should have got my weight down. Yeah. What would you, yeah, because I've heard maybe 10% of your weight or something? 10% of the weight is the figure I heard as well. So for me, that would have been about 80, 80, 80 kilos would, would have been better, which is what yeah. about uh, 19 pounds or something. Yeah. Pounds. yeah. Okay, um, any other questions for Simon? This is great, great tips. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Excellent. All right. Um, well, thank you. I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity for me to share my story and to share my walk and my Camino. Uh, it's, I love talking about it and I strongly encourage those who have done it to do it again. And those who haven't done it, don't be scared. Do it. Do you think you'll do it again, Simon? Oh, absolutely. I was meant to go, I was initially meant to go last year, then I had to have an arthroscope on the knee, so I couldn't do that. And then this year uh, with all the, the lockdowns, it's not going to happen. So now I'm hoping to do it next year. Is it going to be your guys' honeymoon? Well, my fiance <laughs> is not as big on walking. She said she'll come and meet me at some of the stops. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. So Simon's getting married in October. So uh, we wish you the best on that. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you so much for all the work you put into sharing this with us. And thank you. So, uh, good. Awesome. Mm -hmm. so good. So good. So we'll post uh, the video of this. So if there were tips that you want to listen to again or look at some of his pictures, uh, we'll post the recording of this call on, on there uh, so you'll be able to see it. And um, thank you so much, Simon. Simon's been a part of our group since the start. And so we've really appreciated it. And he's gotten up at, uh, I think, 4 a.m. to hit some of our other yes. calls. So he also gets a reward for most dedicated uh, community <laughs> member. <laughs> so thank you so much for that, Simon. That was my pleasure. Really appreciate it. Um, we have Susan that just jumped on from uh, Montana, right? Yeah, sorry. We were so looking forward to this and I wrote down the wrong day and then I suddenly saw the Facebook post. So sorry mm. I'm late. Oh, no worries. We're so glad up. to see you. So glad to see you. We um, have missed Annie somehow. So I'm really worried that she's going to jump on in four more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's in California and I'm worried that there might be a mix up. So if that happens and you can stay on and hear her, yeah. then that would be great. Uh, if not, then we will catch her at another time. So we've gotten to the part of uh, show and tell. So if you have anything that you want to show and tell, you're free to do that. I uh, just brought my hand rosary that I bought at the cathedral uh, when I got to Santiago. And I typically carry this whenever I fly. And a couple of weeks ago, 
I was on a call on one of Annie's groups. I think it was virtual Camino at the time. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it was uh, the author, father, Kevin Codd, who wrote field of stars. And he talked about praying with the rosary when he walked the Camino. And I, so I've just started carrying this now when I walk here in Utah and I just do a decade usually probably should be doing the whole thing, but I at least do a decade and I've have found it uh, very meditative. So just wanted to share that. And then also, as many of you know, when I walked, I was healing a broken heart <laughs> or trying to. <laughs> and so one of the things that I brought back from Spain, probably not legal. I don't know now that I think about it, but I did bring my, what I thought looked like a heart stone. I don't know if you can quite see it, mm-hmm. but, um, I brought this back and usually when I um, walk, I also have this in my pack just to remember that my heart is my own and that um, maybe someday somebody else will get to carry my heart, but for right now, I'm carrying it. And um, so those are my two show and tells for, and you, as you know, probably you've probably heard that carrying a stone is one of the traditions. And when I found this one, I had actually been carrying some stones for a couple of days and got to a um, a labyrinth that was at this little hippie commune kind of stop spot, if you've seen that. And I was gonna leave that on in the center of the labyrinth. And when I got to the center of the labyrinth and I pulled those rocks out of my pocket, they had all literally fallen apart. And so I thought it was very emblematic of my broken heart. And so that's what I left there. And then it wasn't very far after that that I found the new, more substantial heart-shaped stone. And so it was kind of a cool moment for me. So anyway, that's my little mementos that I was going to share. So I don't know if anybody else brought anything that they want to share or talk about maybe what they bought there or took home other than the memories. So I don't know. Susan, Beth, Simon, anything that stands out to you? We have have lots of things, but on our first Camino, they use these little pitchers for wine, especially in Portugal, I think. But I happened to find one in Santiago and brought it home. And so it was just kind of a different thing and kind of special. So that was one of the things that we brought home. Love it. Love it. Simon, Beth, anything you guys can think of? I'm not at my home, so I (laughs) all my things are at home, but I yeah, I collect refrigerator magnets from each place I go now. And so I have a refrigerator display, but I'm not there. Yeah. One of my favorite things about walking with Beth, though, is that you wore your crown. You had your crown with you. I have my crown with me. Yeah, I loved it. Simon, what about you? Any mementos? or? I, I did, yeah. So look, I, I did some of the traditional ones, like the sort of the uh, scallop shell and uh, um, there were some little tiles. I, I know they're very touristy. But I, I do quite like the uh, tiles as well, with, you know, with the little arrow on and things like that, which I sort of brought home with me as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I can't go, I can't wait to go back. Probably one of my biggest regrets is I didn't take a lot of videos and I don't know why. Mm. I took a ton of photos, but I, I didn't do a lot of videos. I wish now that I would have. No. You can go back, you can. Yes. I'm <laughs> Corey and I are hoping to be walking in September, should Spain allow us in. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, I like the idea that you walk from Pamplona, Simon. Um, that yeah. seems like a great place to start. It was, look, Pamp- Pamplona was a fantastic city. I, so I did restos, restos Pamplona, Leon, uh, Burgos and Santiago. So those are the, the, the four places I spent extra days in. And actually those rest days, building that into your itinerary, you really get to enjoy the actual places that you're staying as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, Well, um, Annie was gonna talk about Phil's Camino and I put in the chat in the very, very beginning, there are several links to Phil's Camino, uh, walking to, or walking the Camino, that's also on there. Um, And then this Saturday, Annie's group, it's now called, she just started a new group called pilgrimage in place. And I wanted to mention that to you because this Saturday at 12, I think it's 12 noon, Susan, maybe you'll know. I I tried to find the post before our call and I couldn't find it, but I believe it's 12 noon Pacific time. 
Uh, but John Briarly, who has written, you know, he's the godfather of all the guides. He is going to be her interview guest. So I think that will be really interesting. I've listened to a podcast with Dan Mullins and John Briarly this past week, and it was really, really good. I mean, he, uh, John Briarly, although he is a guide writer, he just really brings a very, I don't know, a spiritual, a very deep understanding of the Camino, not in a religious way necessarily, but in a very deep, soulful way. So I would recommend if you can jump onto that call, all you have to do is just join that group. So it's Pilgrimage in Place. They are doing a virtual tour right now. They're on day two. So uh, it's just kind of fun. Corey and I have been posting on it. Susan, have you guys been posting on it? So anyway, so it's just kind of fun. Yeah. And Susan um, and Kurt, you guys were on the call with, uh, what one was that? Father, Father Kevin? We were, we were on the one with the cookbook author. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Yosmar. Yeah. Oh, Yosmar is fantastic. I'm going to try to get Yosmar as a guest speaker on one of our next calls. She's so interesting. She wrote a book called Taste of the Camino. Mm -hmm. And um, she's also part of the American Pilgrim group. So if you're not in that group, that's a fun group to be a part of. There's a lot of posts, but a lot of good information. And um, Yosmar's book is fantastic. And I, I bought it because I really like her on these calls. But anyway, I made my first successful tortilla española. And it was my first attempt out of four. So it was my fourth recipe and it was phenomenal. So uh, she told me to get a frittato pan, frittata pan. So I got that. And then her recipe must've been the secret sauce because it finally turned out. So I'm gonna try her recipe for the uh, Tarta de Santiago. I've had good yep. success. Have you had good success on that one, Kurt? Okay. Yes, yeah. just made it the other day. Oh, excellent. So you guys, it's a great cookbook. You can buy it at Whisk and Spatula is her website. You can get it on Amazon, but it's like 60 bucks on Amazon. But if you order it on her website, it's maybe 20 some dollars. And it's a beautiful book. The illustrations mm -hmm. are beautiful. And there's probably, uh, how many recipes would you guys say? Oh, I don't know. There's not a ton of 20, 25 maybe, I don't know. But it's, it's a beautiful book and, uh, oh, Susan's grabbing it. Yeah. So I definitely uh, recommend it because Yosmar has been on, I think five or six Caminos, there it is. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. She's been on five or six Caminos. So she kind of takes you through and says, what are the best recipes of the different routes that she's done? So mm -hmm. she'll have Galicia, but she'll also have the Portuguese route. So it was really, really, it's a beautiful book. So anyway, we'll try to get Yosmar on our call. And if there's anyone else that you want us to try to interview during our calls, we'll definitely do that. We are trying to find the best times and um, that's really tough because we have members from all across the world right now. So we may have to go to doing two calls a, a day, Corey. So <laughs> I don't know, maybe we'll try that to catch everybody <laughs> at good times. But um, trying to think of anything else that we were gonna talk about. I think that's it, unless somebody has something to bring up. It's 7.05, so no Annie. So I'll try to get Annie on our next one. Um, something is very confused here because I know she wanted to do it. So I, I'm sorry, it wasn't false advertising. I know she meant to be here. <laughs> and um, if, if you know Annie, she was on that first big documentary and um, the new documentary, Phil's Camino. I can't say enough. I cried through, she has two versions. She has like a 20 minute version and there's like maybe a 45 minute version. And then she did a interview with him that I sat in on and he's amazing. I can't say enough about this guy. He walked a full Camino mileage. So 500 and some miles. He walked in his own backyard because he was on chemotherapy and could not actually go to the Camino. I won't take away from the movie, but please watch it because he is an inspiration, uh, especially right now when we're all kind of still stuck at home and, and whatever. So uh, if you get a chance, there is a free trailer, of course, and then I think there's two different price points. And um, yeah, so if everybody wants to unmute themselves, we'll say a bon camino. If you anybody has a question for anyone, I'm sorry, Susan and Kurt, that you missed Simon's wonderful uh, uh, overview of his trip, but I will post this video okay. uh, so that way you can catch yeah, it. Yeah, sorry we were late. Just no worries. Confusion, but 
I'm so yeah. glad we could see you for a few minutes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mentioned that I posted a video today of Tim Modine's um, Camino. So I would love to interview you, Kurt and Susan, uh, as well, more about yours. And um, Corey and I just started doing that. And so we're just kind of learning to be, I don't know, Zoom casters. <laughs> um, anyway, let me know, message me if you have some ideas of people we should interview or attempt to. Uh, and um, yeah, bon camino. I'm so glad to have seen everyone tonight. Yeah, yeah, thanks again, Simon. Likewise. Thank you, Simon. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Wonderful. It was wonderful. Bon Camino. Bon Camino. Bon Camino. Adios. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.